Hi Jeremy or Modern Vitality. In today's video, we are exploring a question I got in the Modern Vitality Solutions and Support Group, and it is about sex and dating when you have a complex chronic illness. And the question is, Hi Jeremy, I have another question which is sort of personal, but I think it's important and maybe of use to other people. What do you think about dating whilst you're unwell and haven't gone through the four stages yet? I've recently started an unintentional new relationship and there's certain difficulties already and I feel like my health problems are affecting the relationship in multiple ways, like low libido, not developing stronger feelings, and not being able to do lots of social and ac active dates. However, there are positives too that I wouldn't want to lose easily. Also, is sharing germs and a microbiome through intimacy with each other not a good idea when you're already struggling with pathogens? Right. So this is the kind of thing I've spoken a lot about in different videos, but I'm going to kind of tie it all together here. It's tricky, right? And it's not only tricky for the physiology of like the illness, the infl inflammation, pathogens, that kind of thing, but there's also a huge psychology to this that you need to get your head around. So what I'm going to say here, obviously it's personal and it's, it's got to be, um, consenting adults kind of thing, right? You're self-determining. You're in a relationship with another adult who's also volunteered to be in this relationship, right? So everybody's like on the level where they're responsible for their own decisions and what they're going to do. So it's got to feel appropriate and feel right. Now, one of the things I'll say is that obviously not everybody I work with is single when they're going through healing process. A lot of people are married. So you're already going to have interpersonal dynamics as part of the healing process. Right? Some people are married and they wind up getting divorced because the interpersonal dynamics just got destroyed during the healing process. Some people are single and they wind up meeting somebody. Right? There's all kinds of variations here. So I would say that trying to be alone until you're totally healed is unrealistic for most people. And to be honest, sounds kind of miserable because a lot of times if you're in a good relationship, there are so many benefits to having somebody kind of in your corner that gets your jokes and is willing to listen and is like supportive and helpful as long as it's a healthy dynamic, right? So I'm going to explain more about what this healthy dynamic could look like and what it, what it couldn't look like. And I'll go into some of kind of the pitfalls and traps because there are, there are blind spots here. Uh, but the first thing I'll say is that I want to hit the low libido thing first, so I don't forget it. But a lot of times, and I know I've spoken about this in other videos, a lot of times what happens is your body will start to shut down longer term functions, right? When it only has so much bandwidth and so much energy. So if you've got biofilms and pathogens and lions and tigers and bears and whatever, like coming at you and you're dealing with that, that takes energy. You're inflamed, right? If you've got leaky gut and you've got food sensitivities and your immune system's going crazy and your digestive system's trashed and it's not like extracting a lot of nutrition out of the foods, your mitochondria have started to go to sleep, right? To try to limit energy production so that you don't move around and make things worse. There's a lot of things that can happen, right? When you're going through this and it can start to sap your battery. If you're neurologically overwhelmed, things are triggering you, you're not sleeping well, there's just not a lot of extra juice in the tank, right? So what happens is your body will start to prioritize short-term survival over long-term reproduction. So as biological organisms, one of the things you can look at is like, okay, what are we doing here? Well, we're trying to stay alive, right? I'm trying to breathe and have my heart beat and eat food and drink water and things that keep me alive like right now and tomorrow, right? That's one major kind of category of biological functions. And then the other one is reproduce. Right? I, want, I want to stay alive. I want to maintain my DNA alive. And then I want to pass my DNA into the future in some capacity. And that's kind of just as biological animals. It's like what we are programmed to do. That's part of it. That's the backdrop for life. Right. So what happens is our body will start to shift its resources and priorities to short-term survival mode. And that means that we draw away from reproduction, which also means sex drive can go down. Right. Libido can go down. Now, some people not everybody, right? But some people, when they start to get sick with like uh, chronic fatigue or mold illness or something like that, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, right? Any of these, what they'll do is they'll realize that they actually get uh, a little bit of adrenaline from sexual activity. And even though they have a low libido, they'll actually kind of ramp themselves up and become more promiscuous or become just like kind of more of a sex pot, right? Of just doing all these things, but it's, it's almost a way to self-medicate. It's kind of like having a bunch of coffee, right? It gets us stimulated via the kidneys, right? And the um, adrenals. So, that's one way people tend to use sex to try to use it as like an energy drink, basically. And they'll just start doing all kinds of stuff just to get their heart pumping so they can have some more energy. They use it that way, whether it's you know subconscious or not. Uh, most people, though, that part just kind of shuts down or at least dims down, right? And what happens there is then you've got the diminished sex drive, which comes from reallocation of resources and also a subconscious understanding of 
other people have germs, right? Sex is intimate and you're already kind of bombarded with the germs you can't handle as it is if you got hidden pathogens, right? So the body kind of deprioritizes that. Where that then spills out into the relationship, into more of the, the social piece is now your partner, if you don't have good communication around this, your partner might start ruminating, right? Oh, they don't love me anymore. Oh, they don't think I'm attractive anymore. Oh, they're seeing somebody else, right? Just because the, the sex life has changed. But really, it's just because your, your battery's too low, right? So the key here, and this is basically the answer to this question, the key here is communication. How well can you communicate with this other human, right? And what's going on with them? Are they able to listen and get out of their own story and narrative and actually see things from other people's perspectives? Do they have that level of adult maturity? Do you have that level of adult maturity that you can get out of your own perspective and see things how they may see it, right? That will help with communication. And then that's the glue that makes a relationship function and work. Right? So if you have good communication, you can overcome damn near anything. Right? Complex chronic illness, it sucks. It's debilitating. It really it does. It sucks the fun right out of a lot of things. Right? And it messes with your identity. But if you have good communication with somebody and you enjoy being around them, you can you can get through it together. Right? Which is I think for most people it's it's good to have company, you know, instead of having to do it alone. So there's that. There's the sex drive. There's a libido. That's what's going on there. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way, but when you zoom out, this tends to be what happens. I found it very interesting when we have people go through our program, especially like, you know, women in their 60s, right, going through the program, and all of a sudden their libido comes back. And they're like, what is this? And their husband also is like, what is this? Right? We've had, you know, there's ladies telling stories in our group about how they get a little twinkle in the eye in the kitchen all of a sudden. And like, what's that about? Well, it's because you went through the stages, like one, two, three, four, right? Immune system, digestive, neuroadrenal, blood circulation in order. And your body's starting to re-regulate. You're starting to get different kind of hormonal balance, right? It's kind of putting you back online. It's really interesting. So that may be something like, that's a win, right? That's a success sign. That may be something that you want to look out for on your, your healing journey as a, a little bit of a goalpost. You know, to be able to start to get some of that back. And you can, you do. It's, it's quite interesting. So there's that bit. Uh, the other one, obviously with pathogens, you want to be smart about sexual activity, right? I've had people come into the group. We're not shy about these taboos, like in our group at all. We'll talk about all this kind of stuff. I've had questions about foreplay, oral sex, kissing, herpes, all kinds of things. Like, don't be shy about that. It's important, right? We, we're grownups here. We can talk about these things. It's not like... We're not in third grade, you know? So when you start looking at that from the perspective of your immune system, you want to protect your immune system. You don't want to put more problems on its plate, right? So you might use some kind of protection, right? Or maybe if you're used to this person, if you've been in a relationship for a little while or you're getting used to the person, then your body may have already started to merge biomes anyway with them, right? That may be happening on one level or another. We have not only the gut microbiome, right, which is in our digestive tract all the way through our mouth, right, and out the other side. We also have the aerobiome, right, which is around us. So if you spend time with somebody, you're mixing already biomes, meaning there's all kinds of organisms. It's like a cloud. We have an aura, right? We have this like light body around us, but we also have this kind of cloud of filth right around us like pig pen from uh, peanuts, right? It's like that. You just got dust and microorganisms and all kinds of stuff that just orbits you. And when we spend time, especially in close quarters or in proximity with other people, those things start to mix, right? So you're already interfacing. Your immune system's already getting used to that person. Uh, this isn't a hard and fast rule for people, but oftentimes if you like the smell of the other person, not their cologne, not their perfume, right? None of that stuff, but like the actual smell that comes off of that person, like, you know, under their ear or their armpits or whatever it is. If you really like that smell, then that's some of that is your immune system talking to you and saying, okay, this is a, a person who has a compatible system, right? So you might want to kind of let your nose guide you a little bit in that sense. So if you start to like the smell, I'm giving you a, this is a soft rule, right? This isn't like a hard and fast thing, but it's a guideline. If you like the smell of the other person, if that does something for you, right? Then most likely you're getting the green light from your immune system to go ahead and mix the biomes around and it'll be okay, right? Most likely. But of course, be smart, right? You don't want to get um, STDs and things like that. So just make sure you're being responsible adults and don't look at this like it's medical advice. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to see an angry letter come in the mail where somebody got uh, STD because they saw this video and thought I was telling them they could do whatever they want, right? We're still going to be responsible, but we're talking about in the context of complex health issues, right? Complex inflammatory processes where you already have hidden pathogens. Like this um, woman who in the group, she asked, uh, is it not a good idea, right? When you're already struggling with pathogens, right? So you want to give your immune system um, 
You don't want to overburden your immune system. But like anything else, there's a trade-off, right? Because being around other people that you enjoy, because a lot of people that I work with are introverts, right? They, they think they don't like anybody, but really they just haven't been around the right people. So when you start to be around people who you enjoy and who kind of build you up, that happiness that you get from bonding with other people, that will actually help your immune system. It'll help your digestive system too. It'll help your nervous system. It'll help your blood circulation, right? We're communal. When we're around people that we enjoy being with, that actually makes us healthier. It makes us stronger. So there's a little bit of a trade-off, right? Because, you know, if you're having a, a healthy sex life with somebody, then you're going to be getting all these feel-good endorphins and hormones, like oxytocins coming, like all these neurotransmitters. And it's just a wonderful place to be, right? You're going to have that buzz and your, your body systems are going to respond to that. So yeah, there's a trade-off. You might be getting some new, like whatever's in this person's aerobiome or microbiome or whatever you're exposed to, right? But the, the trade-off is then you, that you're buzzing on a different level inside because you're having human connection, right? So you want to go with what feels right, where, where your boundaries are, you know, as long as things seem healthy, uh, then that's something you can follow, I think, you know, use your, use your discretion. But those, those would be the concerns that I'd look at from that point of view. Now, where it starts to get really interesting and this comes back to communication, is that if you're in a relationship, and I've made videos before for people's uh, spouse or partner, right? Because I've noticed this happens where somebody's going through just a hellish thing with illness, right? And then they have a spouse or partner who's there for them and and is supportive. And there can be these weird communication gaps. And I look for self-sabotage with the people I work with because I'm like, listen, I've got a lot of really wonderful ideas and protocols and herbs and all these things that tend to help detangle these conditions. However, if the person I'm working with is getting in their own way and their ego or their subconscious or whatever it is won't let them get better, then they're never going to they're never gonna open the bag, right? They're never going to take my advice. It's going to be frustrating for everybody. So I filter for that. But one of the things I discovered kind of early on in my career was there's also spousal self-sabotage, <laughs> right? Where the spouse does things unintentionally, subconsciously to keep the partner stuck. So spouse, partner, somebody you're dating, right? It doesn't matter, whatever. Um, it's important to be aware of this. And it oftentimes happens from different kind of innocent motives. And I've got other videos about this. Uh, Some of the things to be aware of is that there could be all kinds of subconscious needs going on with the partner. So just to keep this conversation kind of clean, I'm going to say like there's the, the person with the illness that's healing, right? The healing person. And then there's the partner of that person, whoever that is, right? So the person healing, the partner knows them at a certain state, right? And maybe they've fallen into roles. Like, Hey, you don't have a lot of energy. I like to take care of you. I like to be a hero. I like to rescue you, right? And then the person healing starts to get their energy back. And the partner's like, oh, I don't know how to interface with this because I'm used to being the hero and rescuing and stuff like that. And now there's no job for me because you're so much more independent. I don't know who I am in this relationship anymore. I'm freaking out. I'm not going to say it. I'm going to do some weird stuff, right? So we want to watch out for that. So something, how could this manifest, right? Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm healing, I'm doing better. And then your, your partner brings back a bunch of your favorite junk food, right? Oh, here, I got you a treat from the store. Well, you know that that's going to set you back, right? And they know it's going to set you back. But they're not doing it to hurt you on purpose. They're doing it subconsciously. They're trying to bring you back to what's familiar for them. So you need to have these not easy conversations. And this is why I make videos about this, because it, it can facilitate this kind of talking, right? It can get you talking. That's the whole thing is start talking, start communicating, right? Because you want to be able to approach that, not with judgment and anger, but say, listen, this is what, this, I know what's happening here. This is, you're, you're wanting me to come back to where I was just because like everybody, your ego fears change. Even positive change is scary. And you're trying to keep me stuck where I am, even though you would never want me to stay sick right? But there's a part of you that's scared that if I change, something will change in our relationship, right? And oftentimes the partner deep down is is scared that like the person's going to heal and then they're going to outgrow them, right? Or especially if the, the partner really like thinks the world of you, you know, and they think you're great and then you get even better. They're like, oh, you're out of my league now. You're going to leave me. I'm scared, right? So you got to respect that. Our, our egos are emotional, you know, it's not necessarily the best parts of us, right? It's not the part we'd show on a job interview or something like that if we're trying to put our best foot forward out into the world. But it's there nonetheless, and you need to respect it. You need to respect it in yourself and in your partner too. So you have these kinds of conversations, right? It's really, it's really important. It's the same thing that happens when people are trying to lose weight. You know, one, maybe people, you know, you you, you live together for you know 30 years and 
you know, every year you put on another 10 or 20 pounds together. And then eventually one, one of the spouse, uh, one of the people in the, the marriage says, I, I, I'm done with this. I need to lose the weight. And they start making all these changes and they're exercising and all that. And the other one's not ready yet. And now the other one's afraid they're going to get left behind. So they find ways to sabotage, right? It just happens. So be aware of that. And the other is that it's kind of related, but if, if you're on a healing trajectory, like you're going through the stages, right? Stage one's immune do that, right? Stage two, digestive, stage three, neuroadrenal, stage four, blood circulation. We, I have this mapped in order for a reason. It's, that's how your body's going to respond and heal where you can get through one stage and it opens up leverage for the others. This is, it's a process, right? But as you go through that, that process, you may start to change, right? Which would be great, but just keep the other person in the loop. They need to know what's going on because what's going to happen is as you start to change and get your health back and get your vitality back, your identity, your self-talk, of who you are is going to start to change and evolve too. And it's going to be um, kind of tender at first. You're going to be trying out a new identity. I get this in, in our group. A lot of times people will come in, they're going through the program, they're in like stage three or something. Uh, you know, they've been at it for months and they're getting progress, right? But they've been keeping it to themselves and they come in and they'll say, oh, Jeremy, I'm here to share a win today. Um, you know, this started happening about six weeks ago. I started to notice that my brain function was getting better and I've been sleeping better and I've got more energy. I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to jinx it. Right. And I'm like, Hey, you need to say something immediately. Right. You got to start that, that identity. It's like, um, when they're hammering metal, right. And making, making a sword or something, right. You put the metal in the forge and it's all like red and glowing. And that's your chance, your opportunity to start to shape that into something right? So when you start to keep these little wins to yourself, it's like, that was, that's your moment. You need to take this, this new identity that's like malleable and starting to change and starting to see new possibilities for your life. And you need to galvanize that. You need to be very public about it. You need to own it. You need to own your wins. Don't be afraid of jinxing it. Don't be afraid to, you got to knock on wood and all this. No, own it, right? You take, you take an inch, you take a millimeter, you expand into that and you claim it. You say, this is me now. I'm having much less brain fog. I've got more energy. I'm sleeping better, right? And you own that. It's important, right? Because we have this identity that's still like forming. We have to encourage it. So what can happen sometimes is that you're going through this process, right? And you're starting to have these little wins and you're kind of keeping them to yourself. But there's this little part of you that's flirting with this new identity. And meanwhile, your, your spouse, your partner, this person you're dating, whoever it is, they're unaware of all these things. And they have a, an image of you in their mind that is now starting to become outdated. And they don't know that. And so they'll kind of keep putting you back in that old frame that you're starting to outgrow. And what that can do is it can start to discourage some of your new identity from forming, right? Because when you're around them, they're, they don't know it, but they're snapping you back to how it was when you were sicker, right? And what that could mean is basically like um, in an effort to be helpful, they're coddling you, right? Oh, you know, our, our friends called to go out to dinner and I just told them no because I knew you wouldn't have the energy for it. And I wanted to save you the trouble of having to say no. And it's like, hey... I, I do have the energy now, you know, don't, don't put me back in that box, right? I, we need to talk about this. And that's my point. As this process happens, you're evolving, you're moving, your identity is shifting and changing and growing. And the other person needs to learn to be responsive to that and to be able to update their impression of you in real time, right? And this isn't one-sided, by the way, this is just how growth works. Like you should do the same thing for the, the partner that you're with. Always let them be new. Let them give them space to become the newer, improved version of themselves that they're growing into. I don't care how old you are, right? If you're in your 20s, you're in your 70s, 80s, I don't care. You can still be reinventing yourself, self authoring, right? Maybe in small ways, but those small things are important. So we want to always keep this piece of the growth mindset where we're supportive with people growing because, yeah, I work with complex chronic health conditions, right? I'm not just treating symptoms and trying to get people to just have more energy or something like that. That's important and good, but we're looking at underlying systematic compositions, right? What are these causes? How, how is your complex body working and how can we grow and transform that? And what's really happening and why I enjoy this kind of work is that I'm actually on a growth arc. I'm helping people go through growth and transformation. It just so happens that my work involves the context of chronic illness and growth and transformation, right? But everybody's on a growth and transformation arc. If they let themselves. So you need to respect this. It's universal, right? So if you're going to get into a relationship, my advice for anybody getting into a relationship is make sure there's room to grow, right? And make sure that you can both be growing in your own ways without losing each other. And now specifically, if you're having an illness, right? Something that you're, you're working on and yeah, you're, you know, you're going to have your days. You're just going to have your days where it sucks. 
You know, even people like they're going through the program and they're doing great and there's going to be a backslide. There's going to be a hit. That's the reality of it. Right. But even with those days, even with those backslides, if you zoom out, you're still on a path of growth and you want to make sure there's room in your relationship for you to grow. Right. That you're not just playing the patient role and your partner is playing the nurse role. Right. That you're not the damsel in distress and your partner is the knight in shining armor. And that's all your relationships built on. Right. You want to find more than that because long term you're going to outgrow those roles. And you want to stay connected, right? So make sure you're able to grow without losing each other. So there's my two cents on that. You know, I don't know how qualified I am to be giving out relationship advice. Uh, you know, I've been married for a good while now. And I, so far, I think that the key is communication and room for growth. And of course, respecting each other and yourselves. But once you're, once you factor illness into the mix, then, it, you know, it does become a little more nuanced. But again, the best thing to do is go through a whole systems process, right? Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Just be systematic. Get yourself to where your internal state is functioning as best as it can be. And then you're not generating so many symptoms. And then you don't have to worry about it because it's not interfering with your life. Right? You get your world back. Get your re-expanding world. So if you're struggling with these kinds of things, you don't have to do it alone. We've got a wonderful community. It's called Modern Vitality Solutions and Support. It's free to join as a guest. I'm in there every day answering questions. It's a chat group. Right? So you can be talking to all kinds of people from all over the world who are all going through their own healing processes. We've got a vault full of interactive videos. I've got a program for people who are interested in diving in long term. It's an annual program. But at the very least, you can come on in, be a guest for a little while, ask me questions. I'm happy to share my perspective. So you'll find the application. I'll take a look. If you look to be a great fit for our group, then I'll get you in as soon as I can. All right, let's get you feeling better.